morning, everyone. Lord bless you as we meet together. Just uh, let's just commit the time to Him first. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we come this morning to worship you and to praise you and just to meditate upon you. Just pray, help us just to lay aside anything that would hinder us from our relationship with you, from our communion with you. Just pray to that you would remove anything that, that may hinder us. That your name can be lifted up and glorified this morning. Just want to commit this time into your hands and ask that you would take full control of all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. With thanksgiving. That's the one. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his doors with praise. I will say that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. offended me and you know I thought this morning what's keeping me alive not the good feelings not what people say about me but the Holy Ghost and fire Amen, Amen. It's the Holy Ghost and fire
Please have the days of Elijah. Let's sing this one. These are the days of how to pronounce it correctly and then you have all these things but what does it what does it do for you if you don't really know him <laughs> if you don't know him Jesus came on the earth and he said before Abraham was I am well it's good to know who Jehovah is amen let's sing what can wash away my stain what can wash away my stain? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me all again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow.
If Jesus should come, I don't know if you know this song. <clears throat> if Jesus should come. If Jesus should come. If Jesus should come. I welcome. Oh! Uh -huh. 
So if you have a desire for more of God, there's more of God to be received. Amen. I have a desire for more of God. Amen. I want more. I want to see more of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To get a touch from the Lord is surreal. To get a touch from the Lord is preoccupy so much. You know, we have five senses and they all respond to earthly things. And then you have five senses inwardly, you know, your feelings and your memories and whatever comes to your mind. But there's one we want to concentrate on this morning's faith. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't worry about what man does or says, you know, I, I make a lot of mistakes. That's human nature. Like this morning, I forgot to say, welcome to the visitors. I hope you're not offended. But, you know, it doesn't make your day any better when I say welcome or when I don't say welcome. Jesus Christ makes a difference. Amen. I didn't say sorry, Samuel, this morning. Well, it doesn't make any difference, really. The Lord's forgiven us our sins. You see, the Lord is everything we look to. Reach out and touch the Lord. Reach out and touch the Lord.
see the mercies of God, things change in your life. Things just have to change. If you don't see it, say, Lord, I want to see your mercy. Does it mean anything to me hearing the story of the cross? Doesn't really sink in, doesn't really touch me. Lord, I want to see your mercy. Make it real to me. Let that be your prayer. Mercy. Sweet spirit.
simplest thing within the vial. for the battle. You may be seated. Don't know about you, but have you ever heard the trumpet sounding or the bugle when they were going to battle? The cavalry had a very distinct blast and you just knew it was go and attack. And they, they blew that bugle and it meant attack. But if it's just some little long blast of some sort, nobody would have done anything. So is it with the word of God. It's got to be a certain sound to have an effect on the believer. It's got to be a certain sound. Why does Paul in the Corinthians say that? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Why did he use that example? There's a, 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 a trumpet blast that calls for victory, a trumpet blast to say get ready, a trumpet blast. They have all sorts of different ones, but it is a battle. So the word of God encourages us to battle, to fight the good fight of faith. I like to read from the first verse here in Corinthians 14 where it says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that he may prophesy so people do desire spiritual gifts what for so we can serve the Lord in a better way he says follow after charity the ways of love and do desire spiritual gifts but then he says which one is the most important one, but rather that he may prophesy. Prophesy is also preaching, speaking the word of God. And then he says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. 
Can you relate to that? People talk all sorts about God, what it means to them and all sorts, and people don't know what you're talking about. Happens. If I talk about the blood of Jesus Christ and, and how he delivered me and how he did this, to some people it means absolutely nothing. It's just like speaking in tongues and no one knows what you're talking about. That is an uncertain sound. Some people hand you out pamphlets and, and persuade you this is the right religion and this is the right preacher and this is the right church. It doesn't do anything unless there's a certain sound there. And how does a certain sound come? If you're inspired by God to blow that trumpet the right way. You can't actually give a certain sound unless the Holy Spirit is moving you to do so. We can have a lot of religious talk and religious yapping and religious lovely times, but that's not necessarily a certain sound. That's like speaking in tongues. It's all of God. But it doesn't do anything for anybody except you worship God and you feel happy in doing so. I don't know who's spoken in tongues, who hasn't. I have. I didn't know a word I was saying. I was saying things I didn't know what I was saying, but I was worshipping God. It edifies me, but it doesn't edify anybody else. If I start speaking in tongues and have no interpretation, what good does it do for you? Not, not at all. So, <clears throat> it says here, you... For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Sometimes we have, a, have some conversation with, with the Lord, and then we carry it on and share with others, and they don't know what you're talking about. We have to give a certain sound. Then he says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that prophesieth. How can you prophesy? How can you speak the truth unless you're anointed by God to do so? We can't. It's just things we know we may repeat, but that is not what prophesying is. That is just repeating something we learned. But we need to be under an anointing of the Holy Ghost. That people be edified, exhorted and comforted. Otherwise it won't have any effect. Otherwise people fall asleep during the meeting. That happens. People fall asleep. Or people start to drift away and are somewhere at lunch or, or already working out the program for the week. It happens that way. But if something hits home, oh, wonder what God is saying. <laughs> so we, we need God. We need God this morning to speak to us. We need the Lord to, to say something to us that helps us. It says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Makes you happy. It's lovely to worship God. Using words and using groans, using whatever. It's wonderful. But it, it does only edify itself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So, what does that tell us? Let's desire the things which edify one another. When we speak to one another, you don't have to be in church to, to, to prophesy or to preach. When you speak and fellowship with one another, seek the anointing of God to say something uplifting, something helpful to the other person. If you have the right desire to bless a person, the Lord gives you words to bless a person. Let's have that attitude to edify the church. And the church is the fellow believers. Like it says, um, to assemble yourself together as you see the, the day approaching. What is it? That's the church. I would, I would that ye all spake with tongues, Paul says, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, 
except he interpret. And when you have an interpretation, that's again the same as prophesying. Then you preach the truth. The anointing comes on the person who can interpret what's been spoken in tongues. Then it's the word of God again. Amen. And we know there is a lot of, of man's input sometimes and they distort the whole thing. Even in, in the days of the Corinthians, you know, it started. But we still have it this day. There is true speaking in tongues. There's true interpretation. There's true prophecy. But there's a lot of false too. So just let's not be fooled. Let's know what is of God and what is not of God. So he says, But rather that he prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. That's the purpose of it. Why are we here this morning? To encourage one another in the faith. What's the purpose of coming together? I've done my duty to the Lord. No, that's not what it is. It's not when you go to church. You know, I've heard people say, I never ever missed a single Sunday for church. And I always faithfully did this. Well, we come together, not as a religious uh, must, but we come together to be edified by the Lord Jesus Christ. To encourage one another. Now, brethren, it's, he says, If I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? So, there are those ministries. You have a revelation, you share a revelation, and they may quicken to people. And they say, I never saw this. Or by knowledge, something we understand, God has made known to us. Or by prophesying, or by doctrine. And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Are we preparing ourselves this morning to the battle? Get ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what we say this morning. We have to be ready. We have to be in a ready state. Not wavering left or right. Not being tossed and torn. And We have to be ready. Just tell me, what does it matter if the Lord will come right now? What does it matter... Whether, whether you, you haven't got lunch prepared or not, or whether you vacuumed your you, you carpet at home or not. What does it matter? These things don't matter. But these things can hinder us so much from not being ready. Worrying about how we're going to pay the rent next week. These things hinder us to be in a ready state. All your cares cast upon Him. For he will care for you. And you know, there's so many scriptures on that. He says, see the, the birds and, uh, and they, they, they don't do anything. To God, God feeds the sparrow. They don't have to worry. Oh, now tomorrow, I wonder if there's enough food somewhere. The God feeds the sparrow. How much more you <laughs> we're a child of God, you know. Sometimes it's so simple and yet so far removed from our ways or our busy ways because we're still trying to work it out here. We walk by sight rather than by faith. I'm not saying we have to be stupid and do nothing and stay in bed now for the rest of, of the year and say, oh, the Lord will provide. No, we ought to work and do things as He arranges for us. So... But if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So what's important this morning for us? We have to ask ourselves, what's important for me this morning? Is it that I have enough money when I retire? Or is it that everything's well and everything... What's important? The Lord could come today. 
The Lord could come this morning. That's important. What is my attitude? Have I something that holds me back? Have I got hatred somewhere or unforgiveness or, or hurt feelings that can hold me back? I had hurt feelings last night. And I couldn't sleep. My heart went twice the, the rate. <laughs> so I went in a lounge and lied down there for an hour or two. But these, these things are no good. These hurt feelings. They're hard to get rid of. And hurt feelings can lead into depression. Did you know that? And when you have depression, you have a real problem. Because that opens the gates for, for the depression demons to come in. And then you're in real trouble. And then it's a real thing to be depressed. Oh, you don't understand what it's like to be depressed. You know, people who, with depression talk like this. And I believe that it's terrible to be tormented by the devil. It's terrible. But that's how it starts. Where's my peace? Where's my joy? It's in the Lord. Nowhere else. And the whole world can go left or right or refuse to go into the ark. But I go in. And I enjoy being in the presence of God. Amen. Let nothing Amen. hinder you. Nothing at all. He says, Wherefore, brethren, covet prophecy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. But covet prophecy. Say, Lord, anoint me with your spirit that I may speak. The word of God that will help someone to draw closer to you. You know, that's really what it is. I'll give you a, a scripture in Ezekiel 13, verses 2 to 7. The Bible says here, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say, Thou unto them, they prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Woe unto the foolish prophets. That follow their own spirit. And have seen nothing. Isn't that a rebuke to anybody who wants to open his mouth and talk about the Lord? I mean I take these things to heart. I don't want to stand here and talk about something. Oh I know this or I understand that. Oh, I can do a study on this and appear like a teacher. No. He says prophesying out of their own hearts. Yeah. The way we feel today. Oh, I feel terrible today. Let's say, oh, the Lord understands. We all go through these valleys. Oh, we all down here. I mean, there may be a time for that as the Lord anoints it. But we're not going through a valley, we're going to the supper, wedding supper of the Lamb. That's where we're going. We're not going through a valley. We're not going down to hell. Jesus went there for us. So it's very important that we don't prophesy or speak out of our own hearts. And you know, it's an easy thing to do. As I said, we have five senses fighting the one. <laughs> That is either faith or unbelief. Five senses natural. Oh, I've got a headache. Oh, I won't go to a prayer meeting. No, I don't feel like anything. You know, we have five senses battling us. And then we have the inward senses, like I said, with the emotions and memories and, and, and all that kind of stuff. They all fight against faith. Yeah. They all fight against it. And you have a battle on your hand. And it's so easy to speak out of your own heart rather than by the anointed word of God. Yeah. I'll tell you a wonderful thing that happened yeah. many years ago. We were, or oh, maybe married for about a year. We had one baby. And we had a terrible time in the flat we lived. We later found out there was a demon in there. But when we had that terrible time, we argued a lot. <laughs> we weren't a bundle of joy. We weren't happy in, in a sense. I mean, I had to go to work in the morning and, and arguing and talking to my wife till one o'clock in the morning and you had to get up in the morning to, to go and do your work. You know, it was just stress. 
And then what happened, one night I woke up again about one o'clock and I heard my wife crying in a lounge. And I thought, not again, not again, you know. I, said, I went, got up and I come to bed, you know, and I was actually quite upset because that carry on, I had about enough. <laughs> Sorry, it sounds rough, but you know, we were under attack, said so this way. And she says, no, I'm not coming. She had the Bible open there, a box of handkerchiefs next to it for the tears, and said, here the Bible says, a peace that pass all understanding. Joy and love and I can't see it. I want to know why. And I thought, oh man, she's here for the long haul. You know. So I said, oh, do you want me to pray for you? You know, with you. She said, yes. And she was in a total mess. That's what I come to. She was Hallelujah. as low as low can be. And from the heart, she would, you know, be able to give you lots of stories you would have sympathy for to you poor thing and all these different things no i say okay i went on my knees honestly i just about fell asleep i mumbled some kind of a prayer uh, and then uh, i was breathing deep and get a bit of rest and then she started to pray and i tell you what she didn't pray out of her own heart her own ideas, her own feelings, how her own struggles, she prayed in the spirit. Yeah. Man, that lifted me up. You know, I was awake straight away. The most wonderful prayer. Praising the Lord for the victory. Praising Him for the blood of Jesus Christ. Praising Him for the joy and peace and everything He has accomplished for us. She spoke by the spirit. It wasn't in tongues. It was prophesying it was speaking in plain english yeah. and i could understand it and i was lifted up i tell you what i wasn't tired i wasn't upset we went to bed we carried on praising god till three in the morning and then it went bang and the scratch on the window was pushed open from the inside out and she said the devil just left and that demon just left the house whoa we don't want to talk out of our own heart, our own little problems. Yeah. It may sound hard to you this morning. Doesn't mean I haven't got sympathy if you have going through things, but it does not lift anybody up. Tell me who is lifted up when you say, Look, I go through this time and struggle this and struggle that. How do you edify the church with that? You actually drag them down even more. Let's be positive. No matter what, all things work together for good to them. They love God and are called according to His purpose. Amen. Hey, how can that be good? You have to use your brains. <coughs> no, that's what the scripture says. Yes. I believe it. Amen. Edifying the church. And it says they speak out of their, prophesy out of their own hearts. We don't want to do that. Woe unto the foolish prophets, they follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. And they do it zealously too. Yeah. And sincerely. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But unless it's God speaking, yeah. what good does it do to us? Yeah. Unless we have the right battle call from the trumpet, we don't prepare for battle. We just keep going to church and do our little things and Life goes on, oh, I'm getting old, you know, a bit of be ready and, you know, you know of, we want to hear what God is saying. Lord forbid, let us speak by the Spirit of Christ. Lord forbid that we speak out of our own heart. Yeah. It's a trap. I've done it myself. Yeah. It's a trap. Yeah. And it sounds good. And you understand it yourself. Yeah. You feel sorry for yourself in a way. <laughs> And you look for sympathy indirectly, but it's not. So God forbid not to speak from, or to speak from a, out of our own spirit and understanding, or knowledge, or feelings, or desires. You know? Lord forbid. We get that. We have feelings. 
We have desires. We have a knowledge and an understanding. But let's not speak out of our own hearts. Let's speak by the Spirit of God. You know, there was a man. He, he was from the Philippines. He was here in Tarama. And they came one Sunday afternoon to visit us. And he was the ex-husband of some other person. And uh, I was out in the backyard with him. And uh, he looked a little bit disturbed or not too happy, sort of looking down a bit. And I didn't know what to say. I put my hand on him, on his shoulder, and said, don't worry about things. You know, the sun goes up tomorrow just the same, no matter what. I didn't think it was super spiritual, but it was of the Lord. Months later, I saw him. He said, brother, that afternoon I was going to commit suicide. And then you said that thing, and that changed everything. How did I know that such a statement? Oh, I can't even see it in the scripture. Or can't even find it there. Or, oh, that's, we'd never be taught that, to say that. No, that's what he needed. And that was prophecy. That was the Lord speak to him. And what did it do? It saved his life. See, when the Lord speaks to you, it's to preserve life. Amen. To save life, not to destroy life. That's not the way it is. So, let's not just be led by our own understandings and feelings and desires, but by the Spirit of God. Let us truly follow the Lord and the Lord alone. Not looking back, not looking to the side, or to any other thing, but to Him. How easy is it to look back? Oh, we used to this, we used to that. Oh, look to the side. Oh, they do this and that. We don't. Look forward. Look to Him. Amen. Never go backward. Yes. Never look backward. And if you stumble, I always say, if you fall, at least fall forward in the right direction. You know. <laughs> Keep on looking to the Lord, fall in that direction. Luke 9, 58 to 62 says here, And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the de their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Pretty serious. You can say, well, that's a decent thing. Go and say goodbye at home, or, or first go and bury the dead, you know. No, he said, don't. Let the dead bury the dead. And if you have put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Keep on going with the Lord. You know, there was a man, I think it was, oh, who was this man that went converted Chinese? Uh, Hudson, Taylor. Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor had a convert. And this man was on fire for the Lord. And he just found the Lord. And then he went to Hudson Taylor and said, Brother, should I go to Bible school? And he said, No, while the candle is lit, go and show the light. You know, go. Don't be hindered by anything. Some people say, No, no, you have to mature and you have to be in our church for. So many years that you say exactly the same thing as the pastor says and you do the same thing as all the others and, you know, and if it's time to, to go, we all go together and no, otherwise you bring in some new thing. No. Do go forward with the Lord. He will lead you and guide you. Amen. You know, when, when you're a new Christian, okay, sometimes you get zealous. You run into <laughs> the... <laughs> into a dead end street, but sooner or later you find out, oh, that was a bit my effort rather than the leading of the Spirit. You find He'll teach you 
Yeah. He'll teach you yeah. all things. Back. Now I'd like to read another one here in Hebrews 12, 12, 1 to 3. Wherefore, seeing also, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Now, can we say Jesus started the work in my life? Then he will finish it in your life. That's what the Bible says. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And they sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, the joy that was set before him endured the cross. If we know what is to come, if we, if we really believe we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to, to the millennium and rule and reign with Jesus a thousand years, and then we're in eternity in fellowship, if you really believe that, we can endure the little things which happen down here. We can endure them. We can. We, none of us has actually suffered and shed blood. We haven't suffered that much. There are people that have been killed. I had this, well, not call it a vision, but this picture come to my mind. You know, <coughs> the Bible says they used to persecute the children of God. They still do. They were thorn asunder. You know what that means? They used to grab them and call them heretics because they believed in the Almighty God, in the real God. They stripped naked, put the rope on one leg, one on the other one, hang up, legs spread backward on a tree, and then two men with a big saw start to saw them in half, from the groin down towards the heart. And because they're upside down, they don't die straight away because there's blood going to the head. They can cut through the bones, through the organs. The moment they maybe cut the heart, that's when it's finished. But until they're up here with the saw, they're in total agony. That's what they did. But they endured it for the glory that's going to be revealed. How can you endure anything if you don't believe that the Lord is coming. You don't endure if you don't believe. And next time you, you, you down, turn your eyes to the Lord. Say, look, sorry, Lord, I took my eyes off you. I look to the side. Or I, I listen to something, my feelings, rather than your word. Let's do that. So let us run the race that is before us. Let us run that race. You know that great cloud of witnesses, what it is? Some people preach and say, that's the saints looking down from heaven and encouraging us down here. I don't believe that, personally. I can't see a scripture for that, that the saints looking down and say, hey, carry on. Oh, that's my auntie calling. Oh, yes. No, I don't believe that. But the great cloud of witnesses are around us. You're supposed to be a witness, part of the great cloud of witnesses. We had witnesses in the past, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of believers, witnesses, great clouds of witnesses. So let us run the race that's before us. In Jude, I'll give you one or two more scriptures before we close. In Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend yes. for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. Earnestly contend to that faith. You know, when the dead in Christ rise, there are people come up which were burnt on the stake because they would not bow down to the system. They would not bow down to false 
doctrine. They would not bow down to compromise, and they were burnt alive. And they raised first, and you stand next to them, and say, well, I didn't go to church because they were nice to me. Oh, I didn't this. No, look, let's contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And faith does not look to the back or to the side, but looks to him alone. His word is the truth. And that's where faith is looking. And that's what he, Jude, had to exhort the people that they should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men, he says, crept in unawares, who were before old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, these things creep in in everyone's life. It does not necessarily, he always oh, coming through the church door. He may be one of those. No, that's not that. These things are from anywhere. They're creeping in in some form or way, trying to sway you otherwise. Turning the grace of God, you know, the grace of God into lasciviousness. You know how that goes? Well, I'm saved. Grace of God saved me. No matter what happens, I'll be there and then turn and do sinful things. We have to watch that. That is the persuasion that way. And I'll tell you what, we are surrounded by society who do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all around us. You know, he says, certain men crept in unawares. You can also say certain demons crept in unawares into our lives. You know, sometimes look back and say, that was not of God. I should not have done that. Or I should not have said that. Or I should not have looked at that. Or I should not have gone there. There are these influences there. We live in this world and they creep in unawares. The result of this is very evident. And we as Christians need to be vigilant and separated from the now generally accepted filth out in the world. You open a normal, what's used to be called a normal newspaper. It's full of garbage stories, and gossip and nonsense. Absolutely true. I used to be, uh, 30 years ago, I used to read... <laughs> Sometimes at Bay of Plenty times, just tell you, 30 years ago. And they had this great advertisement, family newspaper. And then a few years later, the back page was full of, of prostitution advertisement, advertising prostitution. Family newspaper. And now nobody complains. People are used to it. It's normal. You see, that's, that's how the, they creep in unawares. It's not normal. It's very easy to be influenced and compromise in our faith. Just look at fashion. Have you ever thought of that? People don't think of it. But you know, what, what do you think does fashion warehouses sell? To please the world, not to please the Christians. We get influenced. I find it crazy. I mean, I, I once said to one of my daughters, she was wearing a t-shirt and it had Coca-Cola on it. And I said, are you... Do you have shares with the company? Why do you advertise for them? You know, well, why would I want to run around with Coca-Cola? Or why would I want to run any other stupid thing written on here? You know, the warehouse they sold underwears for children with some filthy writing on them. I mean, they condition everybody that way. Oh, it's just underwear. Nobody sees. It doesn't matter. No, burn the stuff. My mother used to send us well-meaning presents and clothes for our children. Worldly clothes and Barbie dolls. Brand new. I said to my wife, straight in the rubbish bin. Yeah, that is not godly stuff. And then my wife thought, what's so bad about these Barbie dolls? 
And then she came up with something very profound. She said, girls don't play with women. There's always spirits behind these things. Like we read in the beginning, some have revelation. Yeah, it's a revelation. Girls don't play with women. But nowadays it's promoted. It's promoted. Never had so many uh, filth and, and rubbish around like now. I, I went to see Brother Howard the other day. He was at Bay Fair at the Mount. I've never been to this Bay Fair for 10 years or more. Man, there was these two women hand in hand slobbering around. And I thought, it's like being in hell. It's like being in hell. But people get used to it. Now, you hang around Bay Fair every day. You don't see anything wrong with that. But if you come in from the outside, you, you're shocked what you see. But we get conditioned. These things creep in unawares. Now, what is lasciviousness? It's an old word not many people use nowadays. But I looked it up, what lasciviousness is. In a word, to be lascivious is to be lustful. Lasciviousness was condemned by Jesus, Jude, Apostle Peter and Paul. The Bible said it's wrong. Now, I read that somewhere and I thought it, it was quite edifying. Lasciviousness, lascivious behavior may include the way we dress. When our goal is to appear sexy or sensual. I kid in lasciviousness and one picture came up. And there was a woman who had a, a top on that was a bit low showing the brass straps. That's lasciviousness. That's trying to entice or show or present something that's not godly. So, for women, it, like I said, it can be white neck tops showing brass straps, tight clothing, and so on. Lasciviousness includes viewing sexually explicit media from erotic to pornography. That's lasciviousness. Some magazines, movies, television can also come. It also can come through computers that so falsely called cell phones. Cell phones are computers. You can get all the filth in the world on there if you want to. Pornography is addictive. I read that uh, somebody wrote, I don't know who wrote it, but <coughs> pornography is addictive and influences people. It can destroy marriages and sometimes turns people into perverts, child molesters, sexual predators and even murderers. There's a spirit behind it. And you can tell it's not the Holy Ghost. Amen. You look at the fruit. It's not the Holy Ghost. You've been led by a demon. Why don't you see that? I'm, I'm starting to see the things clearer and clearer. I sometimes watch them different. Oh, it doesn't matter. Read some stupid story and, and watch a movie that, that is an R16 or whatever. And, you know, but I start to see that stuff is actually demon inspired. It's not of God. Yeah. Look at the fruit, what it brings. Lasciviousness. Lascivious behavior is also found in the work environment. Did you know that? Where both men and women work together. You know, Brother Bram talked about that. And he said, it's wrong for a woman to go to work. Because there's so much adultery and filth going on in a workforce. I mean... Uh, take that with quotation marks, but I never had my wife going out to work for this very reason. There's influence. And if you have a wife working out there eight hours plus the lunch hour, she is away for 19 hours a day. The people at work have her more than you have her at home. Absolutely. There's a trap in all these things. You see, there are unwanted advances from fellow workers. I've seen it firsthand myself. Flirting, suggestive touching and inappropriate language. Most working women spend more time with their fellow workers than with their husbands. So, that's quite the sermon, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not 
trying to say you're in their place, but uh, it just was on my heart to, to expose the enemy, you know, expose the devil. And we sometimes think, oh, that's just normal. It's not normal. We live in the last days. It's not normal. It's the days of Sodom. It's the days of Gomorrah. It's the days of Noah. It's not normal. It's ready for, to be destroyed by fire, the Bible says. And then, I also say, check what you expose your daughters to at, work, at, uh, at the workplace. Okay, we have Emma, she works in a childcare centre. I think that's fine. Others work in, uh, in different jobs, it's fine. But there are some jobs which are not appropriate. And we have to see what are they exposed to. Nowadays we think it's great. We want our children to be educated and all these things. Yeah, education. Have you ever heard the statement, education is of the devil? Who has heard that? I have. Why? Because it takes people away from the Lord. You go to university, they don't tell you God created heaven and earth. They tell you some uh, fables and uh, evolution uh, ideas and, and what else. They don't draw you closer to God. So it takes you away. Your faith is starting to get numb and number and number. And then you, you're not even aware where things are at. A lot of people are in that shoes. So today's more modern society encourages men and women to be sexy. But for Christians, we have to be <laughs> virtuous. The Bible says virtuous. Virtuous. That's not sexy. You read in a, everything is sexy, you know. Wearing a nice, this, oh, that's sexy. Have a new haircut, oh, that's sexy. You know, it has become so acceptable in a world that they're nonsense. Apostle Paul said, run from sexual sin. Run from sexual sin. I, I read the scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. How were we bought at a price? The blood of Jesus Christ. If we don't believe that we despise the blood, we were bought at a price. And you know, he says here, Paul says here, sinning against your own body. What a thing. Don't you know the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is timid. He doesn't force himself in. He comes by invitation. He comes to a humble heart. He comes to a repentant heart. But he doesn't just storm in. And he doesn't, no, I'm going to be here to stay no matter what you do. It doesn't, he takes a flight, you know. He's timid. So we have to be careful what we do. It's important to understand that according to Scripture... Those who indulge in lasciviousness are putting their souls at risk. Don't, you know, don't cry out predestination. Doesn't matter. No, it's foreknowledge of God. Whosoever is not sealed with the Holy Ghost is vulnerable. And did you know, I just thought about this this morning, about predestination. You know, it has been so distorted that, that people uh, think they have a license to sin because, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm his anyway. No. There was a man in a Bible called Hezekiah. He was a king. And the word of the Lord came, you stay on your sick bed and you die. And he cried to the Lord. You can say that was the word of God. 
He was predestined to die. Have you ever heard of what is quantum physics? It happens that way if not something else somewhere happened. But this Hezekiah was on his knees crying to the Lord with tears of repentance, <coughs> tears of everything. And God heard his cry, extended his life 15 years. You know, things change if we do things. That's what I'm saying. Now Galatians, just as we close, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. <coughs> I, I read it in a different translation here because some of the words seem to make more sense. It's called the Living Bible. But when you follow your own inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. Impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, spiritism that is encouraging the activity of demons. Hatred and fighting, jealousy and anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself, complaints and criticism, the feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group. And there will be wrong doctrine, envy, murder, drunkenness, wild parties and all the sorts of things. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what about I've been baptized? Who's been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus Christ in here? And then I can say, who truly repented from the bottom of the heart? Amen. You see, these things are essential. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you have a doubt that you haven't received it, if your repentance was true, your baptism was true, you will get the Holy Ghost. Praise God. But we need to go according to the word to produce the fruit of the word. You cannot have other ingredients and then it doesn't work. You know, it's even, even if you have a normal recipe, you add something different or miss something. I once made a bread. It's beautiful. Big, nice bread. Looked perfect. But tasted very... <laughs> Didn't have much taste because I forgot the salt. You know, it may look good, it may look perfect, it yeah. may even smell nice, but it didn't taste right because I forgot something. So I didn't have the result I wanted. And you know, sometimes it's so simple, one little thing can stop us from the result. But if you truly repent, the Bible says, repent, every one of you, be baptized in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, uh, 19. That's true. That's the word. That's a scripture. It happens. Well, I have, I have repented. Oh, but never been baptized. Never been baptized the way the Bible says. Or never. Maybe I didn't repent so much because I haven't really done anything wrong. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you can't repent, say, Lord, show me the way I look in your eyes, not in my own, or what people say about me, but what you see in me. And then I tell you what, you've gone on your knees and said, Lord, save me. You know, amen. So, uh, finish with the Romans 8 here, uh, 1 to 11, wonderful scriptures. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if we have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will lead and guide us. We just have to be true to Him. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, Condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? In us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the whole point is to be led by the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. You know, you can be as religious as can be. Like the Pharisees were. 
that walked according to the letter and missed Jesus Christ altogether. They were singing songs and reading psalms while he was hanging on the cross, celebrating Passover. and didn't even know who the Passover lamb was. You know, we need to be enlightened and then led by the Holy Ghost. For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it does not, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And another scripture says, without faith it is impossible to please God. And our faith is actually put into action when we deny the flesh and follow the Spirit. That's where, what, where faith comes in. Not when people are looking, when you're on your own. When you, you walk with the Lord, you and the Lord. Verse 9, but ye are not of the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so the Spirit of God dwell in you. Isn't that lovely? So we're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So that Spirit is quickening us, not just to, to rise from the dead if we should die, or to, to be transformed and, and changed when he comes, but it also quickens the life of Christ in us. It does. It does. Anything that is Christ-like that comes out of you is because the Spirit quickened it to you. Well, but I know so many people that do nice things and good things and all that. It's so good to do these things. But, it, but if you do them and think you're right with God because of it, then you're deceived. <coughs> Nothing but Jesus. Luke 9, 23 and 24. And he said to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. You know, taking up the cross daily, it says daily, is to die to self daily. That's all it is. And to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, being sensitive and willing to do what the Spirit saith. Paul said, I die daily. That's taking up your cross. Nothing else. Die. Oh, what do you mean die? Well, to my own rights. To the feelings, if they're different to the Word of God. To my imaginations, if they're not, not scriptural. You know, we have to die to these things. Timothy 6, verse 10 to 12. Here again, it's in a different translation. It's called a voice. For the love of money and what it can buy. <laughs> you know, that is important part. For the love of money and what it can buy is the root of all sorts of evil. Some already have wandered away from the true faith because they craved what it had to offer. But when reaching the prize, they found their hands and their hearts pierced with many sorrows. You know, when you have money, you think you have power, you have control. Have you ever seen a 70-year-old man with a 20-year-old beautiful woman? I have. Oh, they can swear their love as much as they want, but the old man has a lot of money. The old man uh, has nothing to offer but the money, and it is what it can buy, what it can have. You see? And then at the end, you think, I wasted, wasted all my life. Just imagine a young girl, 20 years old, being with a 70-year-old rich man for 20 years, and then he dies when he's 90. Uh, and then, now I'm a 40-year-old woman, widow, and, you know, it's not joy. 
Anything that is not of God is not joy. He doesn't bring it. So we find ourselves empty-handed. He says, Timothy, don't let this happen to you. Run away from these things. You're a man of God. Your quest is for justice, godliness, faithfulness, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And I don't have to say, Timothy, I can, can name any one of you in here and say, don't let this happen to you. Fight the good fight of faith. Cling to the eternal life where uh, you were called to when you confessed the good confession before witnesses. Choose, look, just finish with this. Choose your examples whom you follow and whom you let influence your life. You see, sometimes we're in this flesh. we, We like to follow something. We are sheep, like sheep. We need to follow something. And you know, when you're in the world, you have an idol. Maybe it's the strongest man or, or the, the smartest man or the most popular or the one who has most charisma. Or you follow something. But we have to choose our examples because they do influence our lives. They do. <laughs> Absolutely do influence your life. Just imagine you follow a sports person. And you're totally wrapped. You watch them and read about them and all these things. And then uh, you have somebody like, uh, well, Tiger Woods or whatever, you know, committing adultery and doing this and that. And then you think, oh, he was such a nice man, so it can't be that bad, you know. That, that's a trap, you see. How many people admired and followed and admired Princess Diana. How many? A lot of people did. I've been in Christian homes where there are books about Diana and books about this and books about that. But you know, she was an adulteress. An adulteress. Living in adultery. I'm not writing her down. I'm just saying facts. And if that, oh, if it's all right for her, you know, she didn't mean to. She's so innocent. It's all right for you too, the devil says. It's a trap. It's all wrong. Follow the right example. Now, I've finished with this. In the Amplified Bible, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul saying, Pattern yourselves after me. Follow my example as I imitate and follow Christ, the Messiah. Follow examples and things which are of Christ. People who follow Christ, the good things, you know. And if a person makes a mistake, don't follow that. They're not imitating Christ. But don't rubbish when they did. Say, no, that was the right thing they did. Follow me as a follower of Christ, Paul. For reading your word, and your word is full of life and power. And Lord, this morning... We just want to be ready, having our eyes fixed on you, knowing that the time is short and the world is in a mess. We, we don't even realize. We, we, we feel like this, this uh, frog in a, in, in a cold water and hot water is added onto it and he doesn't even realize he's getting cooked. Lord, let us not be like that. Let us jump out of this, of this brew and let us have our eyes on you and you alone, Lord, not looking to the side or backward, or to others, but just to you, Lord Jesus. Help us, I pray, and I do ask for anyone in here, if anyone has committed any wrong, Lord, forgive us, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for forgiveness, and for, for uh, if we have grieved your spirit in any way, forgive us, Lord, and make us sensitive again to the leadership of your Holy Spirit, that we may be true sons and daughters of God. And I commit us into your hands now in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this one. I, oh yes, I'm a child of the King. <clears throat> oh yes, oh yes, I'm a child of the King. Amen. Oh yes.
I want you to do one thing. Look, we are in this flesh, and this flesh gives us trouble. And if you have deviated, or look back, look to the side, been influenced or something, let's just be reminded. We all believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, don't we? Or what does it do but makes us part of Him? He accepted us. We accepted in Christ Jesus, Ephesians says. So we are His. So we are sons and daughters of God. And if you have done wrong, even this morning or last night, let's commit it all under the blood and put our chest out and say, Satan, get behind me. I look to Jesus. I'm a son of God. You tricked me, but I'm not having that. I'm going forward with Christ. Oh, yes. I just thought about it. You know, I've met so many Christian people and you couldn't find nicer people who suffer this affliction and this affliction and Satan is tormenting them and there's no power to remove it. You know? You know, the miracles of God can happen anytime, any moment if you turn your eye, inward eye towards Him. It's not even the natural eye. The inward eye to the Lord, the Lord, I believe all things are possible. God bless you all. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a child.